This is the church of St. Michael Le Belfry. Immediately behind me is the glorious York Minster. This church perhaps is not so often visited, but it contains two very interesting things, one of which we'll talk about inside the church, and the other we'll mention here. Because just over there is the Guy Fawkes Hotel. <laughs> and why on earth is Guy Fawkes mentioned here in York? Apparently, Guy Fawkes was born here because in the Church of St. Michael's you have the parish registry which contains the record of his baptism. He attended school here and met two Catholics who were later to become conspirators with him. But to understand why he was moved to join the Catholic conspiracy, to become a Catholic and, and join this conspiracy to blow up Parliament, perhaps we need to wander down to the shambles and there discover the sort of treatment that the Catholics had to endure. This is the shambles of York, and in the medieval period, in the 1500s, this would have been lined with butchers' shops, with carcasses hanging from every doorway and windowway. And it was here that Margaret Clitheroe married John Clitheroe and became the wife of one of the butchers, one of the prominent men. He was an older man in the town. But to tell the rest of her story, I want to go into what is believed to be her house and tell the story from inside there. Margaret Clitheroe chose to become a Catholic and in 1574 received instruction and was accepted into the Catholic faith. Twelve years later, having spent the intervening period several times in prison, but instructing children, sheltering priests, and having mass heard in this building, she was arrested, ironically, by her stepfather, who was at that time the mayor of York. And on the evidence of a 12-year-old Flemish boy that she had sheltered priests and heard mass, she was sent for trial. When she was asked whether she would plead guilty or innocent, she refused to plead. She simply said, I'm guilty of no offence, and therefore I will not be tried by anyone. In those days, it was a criminal offence to refuse to plead. But one reason why she did not plead may have been because if she had pled guilty, or had entered a plea of innocent but been found guilty, then her home and her other belongings would have been forfeit, and her husband would have been very badly affected. And so for the sake of her family, her husband, she refused to plead. But in those days, the penalty for refusing to plead was to be pressed. That means that you would be laid on the ground, sometimes with a sharp stone, a small stone in the small of your back, and then a piece of wood, a plank, an old door would be laid on top of you, and heavy weights placed on top of that door. The idea was that the increasing pressure on your ribs would eventually become intolerable and you would yield and plead. Only the most stubborn prisoners refused to plead under this sort of pressure. Margaret Clitheroe was one of these heroes who refused to plead even though heavier and heavier weights were placed upon her. And eventually, after two days of torture, she died of a broken back and probably crushed ribs as well. As a person who was possibly a heretic and someone who had refused to plead, her body was simply thrown out onto the rubbish heap and there it was left. After some time, her friends dared to approach the body and give it burial. This was six weeks later. And it is claimed that despite having been out in the, in the cold of March, exposed to the elements and to scavenging birds and beasts, 
her body was intact and uncorrupt. Before she was buried, one of her sympathizers cut off her hand. And that has been preserved. It is in the convent, the Bar Convent, here in York. And people still regard it as a relic and an object of sacred devotion. In fact, preserved here in the chapel is a letter from someone who a hundred years ago took a piece of cloth and wrapped it around the hand and then sent it to a friend. And this, the envelope and the piece of cloth were found. They were sent back in the Victorian period out to someone in the Ile de France and they are preserved here in the chapel, in the shrine, as an evidence of the devotion that many people still feel towards St. Margaret Clitheroe, one of the great heroes of Christianity, albeit Catholic Christianity. Welcome to St. Michael of Belfry Church. Uh, we're in the heart of York, by the side of York Minster. And this is a live church where we believe in this, the Holy Spirit guiding us and directing us and a congregation maybe of uh, 700 or so uh, on a, three different forms of service before because uh, on a, a morning at nine o'clock there's a, a reflective quieter form of worship at 11 o'clock there's a family service at two o'clock there's a Chinese service and in the evening at seven o'clock uh, there's a service of celebration uh, and worship which perhaps uh, uses modern instruments and uh, expresses it in today's themes. The church was founded here in about 1522. Uh, it's only of one style and for nearly 500 years then there's been a, a lively congregation to say Jesus Christ is Lord and uh, we worship him here as in uh, 1800s there was a revival in York, there was a vicar here who had a congregation of a, a thousand. Uh, so uh, perhaps God is calling us back to uh, uh, worship together in a way that is relevant for today. And we would welcome you to this church at any time, uh, any of the services, and we would like to show you around the, ch the church, uh, to uh, see our place, uh, uh, you'd be most welcome. Inside this marvelous church of St. Michael the Belfry, there is a very interesting survival. When Henry VIII became king, he of course wanted to stress his divine right to do what he liked with the Christian church. And so he wasn't very comfortable with the hero who stood up against kingly interference in church powers, St. Thomas a Becket. So he ordered all images of Thomas a Becket to be destroyed. But here in this church are some that have survived. Actually, these are part of a set. Four panels that you can see in the window behind me tell the story of Gilbert a Becket, the father of Thomas a Becket who, as a pilgrim in the Holy Land, was captured with his servant and held prisoner for a while. Somehow or other, the daughter of his captor fell in love with him and, according to the legend, helped him to escape. Gilbert de Becket came back to Britain, lived in London, and never thought more about this beautiful girl who had done so much for him. But one day, his servant came rushing in to him to say, Master, the Saracen woman is here. And he went outside to find that the girl had indeed made her way to London. Somehow she had got away from her father, from the place where she lived. She knew no English. She only knew two words, London and Gilbert a Becket. And using those two words, she had made her way across the seas to Britain, to London, and then she'd started walking through every street in London, calling out, Gilbert a Beckett, Gilbert a Beckett. Well, they had a happy reunion. And I'm glad to say that Gilbert, a man of honor, lived up to his promise. And as the pictures in the stained glass window show, she was baptized as a Christian 
and then he married her. And their child was Thomas a Becket, the famous churchman, martyr and saint.